What's going on, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Crack a Pack series. Uh, first things first, I do want to apologize. I know I missed uh, two episodes, I believe. I was actually out of town. Uh, grandmother was having her 90th birthday, uh, and so I was up in Virginia celebrating with her. It was a fantastic time. Uh, really, really happy to see her. But uh, I am back, and we're back with a really awesome pack, Mirrodin Besiege. This set is amazing. Lots of really, really cool stuff in this one. I actually just purchased some singles from this set. Uh, I believe I picked up a Massacre Worm, uh, Ink Moth Nexus, which is a great, great infect card, and a number of other just, you know, little fun cards that I love picking up from time to time. So I am very excited to open this set. Uh, there is quite a bit of value, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in this one overall. So hopefully we'll get some of that. We are going to go through this as if it is a pack one, pick one scenario. Uh, so we're going to do our best to try and figure out what our first round draft pick would be if we were drafting the set. Uh, I didn't draft during this time. I will go ahead and say so this might be a bit of a learning curve for me as well. Uh, so any of you guys that did draft during this time, please, please uh, feel free to leave a comment down below. Help me out a little bit. Help, help, help everybody else out. That's the whole goal of this. Uh, this whole series is to hopefully shed a little bit of light on this set for uh, for those of you who may not have had the opportunity need to open it so regardless our first card here is rally the forces it is a it is an instant for two and one red attacking creatures get plus one plus zero and gain first strike until the end of the turn uh what really makes this card exciting for me is actually twofold <clears throat> one it does not just hit one creature it is all attacking creatures which means it's a board wide uh combat trick which means if you're in a go wide strategy you're going to be able to get a lot of value off of this on top of that, it's nice, of course, to get that little buff, but what's really great about it is that first strike. That first strike makes a huge, huge difference, in my opinion. Uh, it just means that if your 2-2 is up against an opposing 2-2, it makes it so much worse for them to block because all of a sudden you will win combat, always. Uh, and so I love this card for that reason. I don't necessarily think this is a first pick. I think this is something you pick up later in, uh, later on in the pack once you know what you're in. Uh, but I do think this is an actual very, very strong card. Definitely kind of one of those game-winning cards in that go-wide strategy. Very similar to uh, Trumpet Blast, other cards that kind of boost your entire team. Uh, Blister Stick Shaman is a 2-1 for 2 and a red. When it enters the battlefield, it deals 1 damage to target creature or player. I actually really like this card uh, for that pinging effect. I don't love it as just a 2-1 for 3. Obviously, that's pretty understated. Uh, however, uh, being able to ping something for 1 can actually do quite a bit of damage, uh, especially because even if they don't have a creature you at least get to hit them in the face for one damage, which is better than nothing. So uh, out of these two cards, I actually like the Shaman a little bit better. Uh, you're obviously going to be a little creature focused anyway. It is limited, but definitely not the thing we're hoping to get uh, as our first pick. But I do think it's a decent card. Uh, not amazing. It does die very, very quickly with only that one toughness. Uh, Divine Offering is an instant for one and a white. Destroy target artifact, you gain life equal to its converted mana cost. Uh, much more of a sideboard card, however, this is Mirrodin. My assumption is, uh, and if I rem am remembering correctly, there's quite a lot of artifacts in this set. Uh, and so artifact removal could probably be considered a little bit closer to just actual removal. Uh, you're going to be running up against artifact creatures, I would assume, uh, a decent amount of the time. Uh, and so something like this, I think, has a lot more utility in a set like this over, a, say, a core set uh, or maybe a, a Ravnica set where multicolor tends to be the theme. Uh, it's always really, really important when you are drafting, be very aware and very conscious of the kinds of cards that you're expected to see. Obviously, Ravnica, like we said, very multicolored heavy, you can get buffs off of cards like that, or you can, you know, shut down multicolored cards with specific ones. But in a set like this, where artifacts tend to be the focus, it's great to know that ahead of time going into it, because then you can pick up cards like these knowing that, you know, 90% of the time you're probably going to find a target. I think based on that, this in this environment, uh, this card is actually much more worth playing. I think potentially better than the Shaman. Uh, I don't know for sure. Obviously, we'll see throughout the rest of the pack, but that's my assumption. Again, banking on the fact that there are probably a lot more artifacts in this set. <clears throat> so far, though, it looks like red cards are at the forefront. We do have Crush. It's an incident for one red. Destroy target non-creature artifact. Uh, so again, we're seeing a lot of artifact hate, just a huge signal that artifacts are, of course, going to be a big part of this set. 
Uh, what's kind of not great about this is that it's a non-creature artifact. In Limited, of course, you're going to be running up against a lot more creatures than you are most likely anything else. Uh, of course, that's not always the case. There are always going to be those outlier decks, but generally the games are one on board, and so you really want to be able to have that on board protection as best you can, which is why removal in the bread uh, sense of drafting is so high up on the list. Bombs and then removal. Removal is very, very key. Uh, you do need to be able to deal with the board. This can deal with specific cards. However, it doesn't deal with the creatures, uh, which is a huge, huge part. So I do think Divine Offering, much more flexible, much better card in this instance. Uh, Fangren Marauder is a 5-5 five, five for 5 and a green. Whenever an artifact is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, you may gain 5 life. Uh, certainly a pretty powerful card. This is actually one that we've seen in, I believe it's Popper Tron or something like that, or Popper uh, Affinity. That would make more sense. Um, and it's actually a really interesting card in that one because it services as a very strong bomb, uh, but it also gives you the potential for life gain, which is kind of strange. Uh, excuse me, it's the Atog deck that this is in, which artifact deck. Anyway, uh, very interesting card for sure. Uh, I don't know... If it's better than Divine Offering, I think this in limited is like good, but probably not quite as amazing as obviously in a constructive format where you can really build for it. Uh, I do think obviously, again, we're expecting that there's a large number of artifacts in this set, so I don't think it's unlikely uh, that you'll be able to trigger this, but it is much more of a late game card. So probably only once or twice at most. Still, it's a lot of life. So I don't know. I feel like Divine Offering and the Marauder are kind of it's that bomb and removal kind of situation. Which one would you rather have? Generally, I would say lean towards the creature. So I'd say the Marauder. I'm going to keep them together, though, for now. I'm not necessarily expecting that these are either one of these going to be our first pick. But we'll see what we get. <clears throat> uh, Steel Sabotage is an instant for one blue, and you choose one. So counter target artifact spell or return target artifact to its owner's hand. Uh, what's great about this is not only is it very, very cheap, but it's also very flexible. Uh, it works great as a counter spell in this set. Again, expecting that we're going to have that high artifact count that we have not seen any yet. Uh, or it can bounce an artifact and just give you that tempo that you might need to kind of close out the game at a, at a later point. Uh, and so I do actually really, really like the flexibility on this. The fact that it's only one blue mana is amazing. Uh, the fact that you can counter target artifact for only one blue is in a set like this, I have to assume it's very, very good. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> that being said, it's very similar in line to the Divine Offering in that it's basically a removal spell. I mean, this obviously counters it, not, doesn't remove it from the field, uh, but plays that similar role. However, it also provides that bounce effect. So actually kind of like both of these, or all three of these, I should say. Again, I'm going to kind of cop out for now, and we're going to keep them together. Of course, we'll make a decision later on. Uh, Gliss's Courier uh, is a 2-3 for 1 and 2 green, and it features Mountain Walk, which is actually a really old school mechanic now. We don't see it anymore. Uh, but Mountain Walk essentially means if the opponent uh, controls a mountain, the land mountain, uh, this creature is unblockable, uh, which is very, very good if you know the opponent has a mountain. If you don't, it's quite bad because it is only a 2-3 three for 3, so you're a little bit understated. This is much more of a sideboard card. It's a very good sideboard card if you know you're up against red. If you're not sure, probably not worth main decking. I think it's an okay uh, like three drop slot if you just are really short on playables. Certainly not a good first pick though. This is something that you probably will pick up mid to late pack uh, when you you know are kind of running low on picks. You find yourself in green, maybe pick this up just so you can have that extra little tech uh, against all those red decks, which it looks like somebody's going to be in a red deck for sure. <clears throat> Uh, Flinzer Might, I uh, hope I'm saying that correctly, is a 1-1 one, one for 1 and a black. It has Infect, so it deals its damage to creatures in the form of negative 1, negative 1 counters, and then to players in the form of poison counters. And when a player gets 10 poison counters, if you don't know, uh, they automatically lose the game. So think, if you're dealing damage uh, via Infect and not via regular damage, think of it as like having a 10-point life total versus a 20-point life total. That's why we've seen Infect decks uh, be very, very good in certain formats, though a little bit less so now. Uh, this also has lifelink, though, so whenever it deals damage to a creature, it also causes you to gain that much life. Or, excuse me, uh, whenever this creature deals damage, that could be to a player as well. Um, I don't super love this, uh, if I'm honest. 
mostly because it's a 1-1 one, one for 2. Uh, certainly those keywords are great, but they don't mean quite as much when you're playing this you know, on turn two and you've only got a 1-1 one, one that doesn't match up to many creatures. Uh, I th certainly think you could pile stuff onto this and make it really cool, but if this card requires other cards to be very good, I don't think that makes this card very good. So I'm not in for this card. I think we've got better options so far. Uh, Virulent Wound. hope I'm saying that correctly. I probably am not. Uh, is one black for an instant. Uh, put a negative one counter on target creature. When that creature is put into the graveyard this turn, its controller gets a poison counter. So I uh, actually really like this card. Uh, it's not amazing, but it is very, very efficient. Uh, if it's well-timed, it just means that you're dealing with a creature, but you're also uh, giving your opponent that first poison counter or a poison counter. That could be the one that finishes the game. Uh, and so I think this has a lot of utility. I don't think it's amazing. I don't think it's better necessarily than the cards we've already got. Uh, again, that might be me just mis misunderstanding the flexibility of this, but uh, I think the other cards deal with stuff kind of more on their own, uh, whereas this is only going to be able to deal with something like an X one on its own. It's going to need something else to be really, really good. Uh, and so for that, I think I'd rather have the other cards. They're just a little bit more flexible by themselves. Hey, our first artifact. <laughs> uh, Dross Ripper uh, is a four mana three three. Uh, for, two, uh, for two and a black, you can give it plus one, plus one until the end of the turn. Don't super love this. Uh, the art is beautiful. I actually really love the art. However, um, it's a lot of mana to sink in. Uh, you're paying four up front for just a three, three, which doesn't feel great. The upside being, of course, that it does fit into any deck, I will say. However, its ability has to be put in a black deck, and it's very expensive to just give it plus one, plus one. Uh, I will say mana sinks like this, though, tend to be pretty good if you can get them at the right time. Uh, and so it's very nice to have a mana sink if you just have nothing else to do. But that doesn't make it a priority. There are so many other things that I would much rather have than this that I don't think that this is high up on my list. Uh, Malira's Keepers. Uh, is a 4-4 four, four for 4 and a green, uh, and it cannot have counters placed on it. Uh, that may seem like a very innocuous effect. However, we've seen Infect in this set. We know Infect is in this block because New Phyrexia and all that stuff is in here. 100% the Infect set, uh, if, if there ever is one. So uh, what's really nice about this is this just is a hard block on board to Infect creatures. They can't do any damage to it because uh, they deal their damage in the form of those negative one counters. Uh, and so this can't have any of those. It essentially negates that damage. So this is actually a very strong card, I think. I don't think it's like amazing by any means. It's much more of a blocker. However, there are certain situations where this is going to be able to get in for four damage here and there and could very easily get you uh, to the win if you needed it to. So I kind of like it more than the other cards that we've got. I don't know if that's 100% the best thing uh but i kind of like it i think it's got that built-in uh kind of blockade feel and I, I really like that this might be better uh vidalkin anatomist and not anatomist one of those uh it is a one two four two and a blue uh, you can pay two and a blue tap it put a negative one counter on target creature you may tap or untap that creature uh, this is a pretty good card, uh, in my opinion. So for a lot of reasons, one, it's not the stats. Let's just go ahead and get that out of the way. It's a one, two for three. That's not great. But, uh, you get to put negative one counters on stuff, which is, just gives you an onboard way to deal with bigger creatures. You can start whittling them down with this. Uh, but also you get to tap that creature if you would like to, uh, or there are going to be situations that may arise where you could, for instance, Use this on the keepers, untap the keepers, but it doesn't get a counter because those counters can't be placed on it. And then all of a sudden you just have a 4-4 blocker almost always, as long as you can leave up that three mana. I will say that is fairly expensive, but for what you're getting, I think that's worth it. Uh, I think this has a lot more utility than any of the cards that we've seen so far. So I definitely think so far this is the pick. I actually really like this card. Uh, Core Prowler. Uh, it's a 2-2 two, two for 4 of any color. 
does also have infect, as we've talked about already. Uh, but when it's put into the graveyard from the battlefield, you get to proliferate. So proliferate is a very interesting mechanic and a very strong one at that. Uh, it basically says you choose any number of permanents and or players. Uh, if So if players have poison counters, you can choose them. Uh, planeswalkers work, anything like that. If they've already got a counter, you are able to tick those counters up by one. You get to add another of that single type. Uh, and so if your opponent has nine poison counters, you only need one more to kill him. This dies, all of a sudden you can win. Uh, so this has a lot of interesting utility. It doesn't seem great on the onset solely because it's a 2-2 two -two for four. Uh, Infect makes it much better in my opinion. And then the ability to proliferate is also very, very good. I kind of still like the anatomist a little bit better, if I'm honest. Excuse me. I think that it has a little bit more utility. Uh, this is going to get outpowered, obviously, pretty quickly. So is the anatomist, to be fair. Uh, and certainly this is a less less of a mana sink, we'll say. Uh, man, I'm kind of talking myself out of it. We're, we're going to keep, keep them together. We're going to see what our rare is because there are some very good ones in here. Ooh. Yeah, this is a pretty good one. Uh, Bone Horde is four of any mana for an artifact equipment. However, it has living weapon, uh, which is a super, super cool mechanic. So when this enters the battlefield, you immediately put a zero, zero black germ creature token onto the battlefield, and then you immediately attach this to that germ token. Uh, so you don't have to worry about an equip cost right off the bat. Uh, it immediately spawns a creature and equips itself to it. The equip creature gets plus X plus X, where X is the number of creature cards in all graveyards. Uh, what's key about that is it's all graveyards. It's not just your own. It's not just your opponents. That adds up to a lot of damage. For only four mana, that's quite good. Uh, not only that, but it, you can equip it for two to any creature. So even if the germ dies, or if you need to move it over to another creature, you can do that. This just deals so much damage uh, over the course of a game. If it sticks around, which it most likely will, uh, it does such a great job. Now, there are things to think about. We did see a lot of artifact removal, uh, and so there are going to be ways to deal with this more so in this set than there probably would be in other sets. However, I still think this is much, much more worth it than any of the cards that we've seen so far. We do not have a foil, so my pick is Bone Horde. Pretty easy pick in my opinion. Feel free to disagree, of course, in the comment section below, but I do think that that's the pick. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to leave a like or a comment down below. And as always, please make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome content. Uh, before I go, I just want to mention also, uh, our giveaway is still going on. Uh, if you're interested in uh, picking up a free booster box of Throne of Eldraine, you can do so by entering our giveaway. The winner will be chosen at the end of the week. Uh, all you got to do is subscribe, comment on any video with Booster Box Giveaway, uh, and you're entered to uh, to win. That's it. So pretty easy. Uh, we thought we'd do something a little bit bigger for the end of the year. So uh, also next week, I don't think we're going to be doing videos at all. Uh, I don't know for sure yet, but that certainly seems like the plan. We'll see how things pan out, uh, but I don't think we're going to do any scheduled videos next week. So just adds up there. But thank you guys so much for watching. I'm going to see you in the next Crack-A-Pack video.